Hi, my name is Juliet Richards and today I am going to explain to you what actually is at the root cause of insulin resistance and how you can reverse engineer it. Because if you want to reverse engineer something, you really need to understand the mechanics of it first. I think that sometimes we get a little bit too simple or reductionist about how um, insulin comes about. And if we get too reductionist, then we can sometimes overlook some important factors. So if we start on the left hand side of the board here, so all foods are made up of three main macronutrients. We've got carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Now, when we eat food, we don't eat a carbohydrate or a protein. We eat food and the food will contain any combination of these three ma main macronutrients. Now, if the food is particularly high in one of these macronutrients, then we will lump it under that category. For example, bread, pasta and rice are all high in carbohydrates. So we will lump them under that category. Whereas something like fish is high in protein as well as high being high in fat. So really it could come under either. Now, keep in mind that the images I have here are just examples of foods that we would commonly associate with these macronutrients. There are a number of foods missing from this picture, um, including lots of vegetables, um, as well as a lot of the refined and processed types of foods. So these are just for example. Now fats are made up of lots of little fatty acids. So if you think lots of little fatty acids, they make up the building blocks or they're the building blocks of fats. Proteins are made up of lots of little amino acids. So if you think Lots of little amino acids make up proteins. Now, carbohydrates are made up of lots of little sugar molecules. And the one we are most interested in is glucose. So, so I would call it glucose or sugar interchangeably because it's the same, same thing really. Now, when you eat a meal, it'll be any combination of these three main macronutrients. And you will chew it up, it goes down your esophagus and into your stomach. And in your stomach, this is where it's broken down into these smaller molecules. And because it's broken down into these really small molecules, they are small enough to get through your gut wall and into your blood. So I will just just going to put glucose there now because that's what we're talking about today. Now our bodies are incredibly clever and they like everything to be within a nice safe range which we call homeostasis. Because if things get too high, then they can start causing problems. And if things get too low, then they can also start causing problems. So the body is constantly in this dynamic state, trying to keep everything within this nice safe window. So before the glucose has even gotten into your blood, there are messengers sent from your gut to the pancreas, which is a little organ underneath the stomach there, telling it to release insulin. Now, I'm sure you've heard of insulin before. What is insulin? Insulin is a hormone. And if you think of hormones like chemical messengers, so they send messages throughout your body to tell your cells to do different or various things. So insulin is important because it acts like a key to let glucose into the cells. So without insulin, 
I'll do. Without insulin, glucose could not get into the cells. And why, does, why do we need glucose in the cells? Well, glucose is really the main energy source for our cells. So if you think of a car, you need to put fuel in the car so the car can run. So all of our cells are similar and they need this glucose so they can function. So insulin acts like a key to open the cells to let the glucose in. Because glucose in our blood is actually useless. It can't actually do anything. It'll just travel around your body and if it starts to build up, then that's when it starts to cause problems. So we need to get the glucose or sugar out of your blood and into the cells where it can be used for energy. So this happens in a nice coordinated fashion in someone without diabetes. And now I will move on over to the right hand side of the board to explain how diabetes comes about. So when we eat food, we tend to eat more than we need for that current point in time. Now we are always burning energy even when we're sleeping because our brain is ticking over, our lungs are filling with oxygen and our heart is beating. But when we eat, even if it's just a snack like an apple, we will use up some of that energy. But what do we do with the extra energy or the excess energy? So first of all, we can store it in the liver. So if you think of the liver like a backup battery, we can store this glucose as glycogen and we can store it there for a rainy day. A time when we actually call on the liver quite regularly is overnight because technically we are fasting. So to prevent your blood sugars dropping down too low, the liver will actually release some sugar back into the blood to keep them again within that nice safe range. So once the liver is full, then we can store glucose in our muscles as well as glycogen. Once our muscles are full, then that's when it spills over and we can store it as fat. And it's fat around the belly and around the organs that we care most about. And that is because it acts almost like an organ in itself. So we used to think that this fat just sat on our body and it was pretty benign. But now we understand that actually it behaves quite differently and it carries with it a lot of risk. So the fat around the belly um, can contribute to inflammation in our body, which we are learning a lot about. Um, so in the last decade or so, we are really understanding how inflammation is a key driver or really is at the root cause of many diseases like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, depression, and even diabetes. So the fat, in particular around the organs really does play a role um, with this inflammation. Now something that is quite characteristic of this fat that is in abnormal places, um, you know, like the liver, the pancreas, um, and as well as the fat just around the belly, it acts like putty in the keyhole. So it actually makes it really hard for that insulin to work and we call that insulin resistance, which is really at the crux of type two diabetes. So if we did a blood test in the early stages of type two diabetes, we would actually find that you have high levels of insulin in your blood. And that is because type two diabetes does not happen overnight. It's been years in the making. I'm talking 10, 20, 30 plus years. This insulin resistance has been slowly building up. And because the body has been doing a mighty fine job at keeping those blood sugars within range, we haven't noticed any changes. But because this insulin resistance builds up, to prevent those blood sugars going up and to make sure we can keep getting the, getting the glucose into the cells, the pancreas has been compensating. So it's been releasing more and more insulin into the blood to make sure those glu the glucose or sugar molecules get into the blood and stay within that nice safe range. 
So over time, if we don't address this underlying insulin resistance, then your pancreas actually starts to get exhausted and it starts to run out of insulin. So then we start to see this insulin deficiency and the insulin resistance and the insulin deficiency together will both cause your blood sugars to continue to rise. Now, high blood sugar levels, if we don't manage these, they can also be toxic to the pancreas as well as the rest of the body. But if we're talking about you know, what causes diabetes and what causes the diabetes to progress, this glucotoxicity or you know, high blood sugars, they can also contribute to damage to the pancreas, which basically is going to speed up the decline and you're then not able to produce insulin yourself. So the other thing that these high blood sugar levels in our body do is they also contribute to inflammation. And again, this inflammation is really at the root cause of many of these diseases. And the inflammation in terms of diabetes, it acts also like a barrier. So preventing the glucose to get into the cells, from getting into the cells um, and contributing to that insulin resistance. So if we then come back to these macronutrients, carbohydrates are for fuel and energy. Proteins are for building and repair. And fats are also for fuel and energy. So our bodies will preferentially use glucose for fuel because that's just the way it is. Our bodies preferentially will use glucose for fuel. However, glucose needs insulin to get into the cells. Whereas fat does not need insulin to get into the cells. So if you have a meal that is high in fats and carbohydrates, and you have this insulin resistance in the background, then the fats are just going to get straight into the cells and they're actually going to block the glucose out. Again, contributing to insulin resistance. So the fats and the carbohydrates or fats and sugars, they compete for storage in the cells. And again, if you have fats and carbohydrates in your meal, the fats will get in first and they'll block the carbohydrates out. So yes, carbohydrates play a role, but fats do as well. So, you know, we can't just point our finger at one thing because we take our eyes off another thing. If you're thinking that, okay, great, that means I can just eat more protein and less carbohydrates and fats. Well, no, it doesn't quite work like that because Proteins, if you have too much protein, it actually just gets um, converted to glucose anyway. And you also need to be careful about the proteins you're eating because diets high in animal products, in particular red meat and processed meat, actually contributes to insulin resistance. And that is a whole nother um, episode that I, I'll go into another time. So uh, it's not quite that easy. Now, there are a number of other things that contribute to insulin resistance, and that includes a lack of sleep. So even one night of poor sleep can contribute to insulin resistance um, the next day. Stress really activates the sympathetic nervous system, 
uh, which is that fight or flight response and will elevate cortisol, your stress hormone, and that will all in itself contribute to insulin resistance and physical inactivity as well. So physical inactivity is actually quite inflammatory and it contributes to weight gain and it will also contribute to this underlying insulin resistance. So there are many things that we can do to address this insulin resistance, which is the good news. And if you want to reverse your diabetes, you really need to understand what is at the root cause, because if you're just targeting one of these things, then you oversee all of these other um, contributing factors and you know, the likelihood of reversing the diabetes is much less. So in the next um, part, I will be explaining what you can do um, to reverse your insulin resistance for good.